Hi, my name is Petra Yam, and here at Onda, we focus on developing measurement technology for ultrasound applications. Despite trying times with the emergence of the coronavirus, we're very pleased to be a part of the ACS this year, and particularly happy to honor Dr. Mithel's 75th birthday. For this study, we have the fortune to collaborate with other leaders in the field, including the team at Blackstone Nay. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, John as well as Dr. Kiswani, representing the University of Arizona. Today we'll share a study which is titled Acoustic Characterization of a Degas Fluid with Cavitation Measurements, Process Enhancements to Ultrasonic Cleaning. Let's start by talking about why, the motivation. Although ultrasonic cleaning has been used for many decades, it's a complex, dynamic process with many process variables to control. Some have called ultrasonic tanks black boxes and acoustic probes random number generators. One process parameter that clearly influences cleaning performance is the amount of dissolved gas in solution. In fact, it is common to degas the fluid before ultrasonic cleaning. That said, it is not well understood how process parameters like temperature can inadvertently change the amount of gas. There are two recent activities that enable us to take a closer look at these mechanisms. The first is a release of an international technical specification describing the method, describing how to quantify cavitation. And two, the availability of a measurement instrument. And in this study, a cavitation meter is used to, to determine how cavitation changes with varying dissolved gas concentrations while keeping the temperature fixed. Let's begin by reviewing how ultrasonic cleaning works. It starts with some form of mechanical agitation that disrupts the hydrodynamic boundary layer allowing the particle to, to be detached and lifted into the bulk fluid. Of course, this mechanical agitation here is in the form of ultrasound. A sound wave generated by a transducer propagates and oscillates between the positive and negative pressure at the drive frequency. When there's a rapid change in pressure, in a solution with gas, acoustic cavities form. With less gas, there are less acoustic cavities that are generated. These acoustic cavities exist in one of two states. They either oscillate in size and dimension, known as stable cavitation, and above some pressure threshold, these cavities collapse, known as transient cavitation. And so in this study, we take a closer look at how the level of dissolved gases affect the cavitation pressure. Um, the experiment relies on cavitation measurements in a 133 kilohertz ultrasonic cleaning tank that was coupled to an inline vacuum degasser. The medium is water, and the temperature is controlled within a range between 22.6 degrees Celsius and 25.3 degrees Celsius. To measure the dissolved gases, we use a dissolved oxygen meter as the degassing system varied the level between 8.8 .8 milligrams per liter, which is the concentration of starting tap water, down to a degas level of 3.8 milligrams per liter. And we used a cavita cavitation meter called the MCT2000 to measure the acoustic pressure from the stable cavitation, transient cavitation, and the direct field, as well as the fundamental frequency. Before diving into the data, let's review the measurement method used to quantify the cavitation. The principles to analyze spectrally the cavitation behavior has been generally accepted for decades, but it's only recent, in fact, last year in 2019, that a formal 
international standard was published through the IEC committees. To follow this method, the measurement relies on a piezoelectric hydrophone submerged in the tank that acquires a highly sampled pressure signal from the acoustic emissions. This raw voltage waveform represents the voltage amplitude as a function of time. To analyze the frequency components, a Fourier transform converts the data from time domain to frequency domain to look at the spectral content. And now you have voltage versus frequency. And to, to correct for the frequency response of the hydrophone, the hydrophone calibration, which consists of a table of acoustic sensitivity values, or factors in units of volt per pascal, as a function of frequency, is used to convert the y-axis from voltage to pressure. Now you have SI units in both x and y axes and the spectrum, the pressure spectrum, can be analyzed to quantify the pressure from the stable cavitation, transient cavitation, and the direct field. The instrument used in this study is called the MCT2000, which follows this method and saves the following layers of data, namely the voltage waveform, the pressure spectrum, and the calculated parameters. Jumping to the punchline, we take a look at a summary of the acoustic measurement data, which was collected at different dissolved gas concentrations. And we observe a few trends. First, we observe that the cavitation pressure, both the stable and the tra transient cavitation pressure, decrease with less dissolved gases. In the plot here, the red represents a stable cavitation pressure and the green represents a transient cavitation pressure. And you can notice both decrease with less dissolved gas. This may be expected by most. The second trend is that the stable cavitation decreases at a higher rate than the transient cavitation. So the red bars decrease at a higher rate than the green bars with less gas. And we found that interesting. And a third trend that we found interesting was the fact that the direct field sound pressure, the line in blue, increased with less dissolved gas. And as a sanity check, we took a closer look at the lower level spectra and confirmed the shape. Specifically, the fundamental peak at the drive frequency of 132 kilohertz is in fact higher in amplitude with less gas while the harmonics are lower. The measurements are repeatable and there's error bars in each of the pots, um, all within 10% one sigma. So now we hypothesize the different mechanisms to help explain these trends. And what we came up with is the following. The first trend is expected perhaps and is somewhat straightforward to explain. Acoustic cavities form in the presence of dissolved gases and nucleation sites. During the rarefactional phase, the acoustic cavity grows as dissolved gases diffuse into the acoustic cavity. During compression, the opposite occurs where the acoustic cavity reduces inside and gases diffuse out of the cavity into solution. With less dissolved gas, there's less acoustic cavities that form. The second trend where the stable cavitation decreases at a higher rate than the transient cavitation pressure may be explained by a couple mechanisms, rectified diffusion and a cushioning effect that occurs when the acoustic cavity collapses. The third observed trend where the direct field pressure increases with less dissolved gas may be explained by an acoustic shielding effect. This mechanism has been reported in lithotripsy applications where the presence of gas bubbles and acoustic cavities can perturb the direct field sound waves. So let's talk a bit more about rectified diffusion. 
the formation of acoustic cavities start when there is pre-existing gas in solution because the pressure within the gas pocket is lower than the pressure in solution. Dissolved gas diffuses into the gas pockets forming an acoustic cavity and they start to expand during the rarefactional part of the pressure cycle. The acoustic cavity continues to grow until reaching the compressional phase of the pressure cycle where the cavity begins to contract as dissolved gases diffuse out of the cavity back into solution. And because the surface area and the shell thickness of the cavity change as the cavity size grows and contracts, the diffusion rate of the dissolved gas is also different. So the diffusion rate is higher when the acoustic cavity is expanded and lower when the cavity is compressed. So after repeated cycles, this unequal mass transfer is what enables the cavity to grow in size over time and eventually become buoyant, effectively degassing the solution. And this allows these acoustic cavities to float to the surface. And in conditions with high gas concentrations, there are lots of stable cavities, while at low levels of dissolved gas, there are minimal stable cavities. And perhaps this is a mechanism to help explain why stable cavitation pressure is very sensitive to the level of gas concentration. It's true that this trend may be unique to these conditions, but you know, th that is at higher sound pressures, the likelihood for the acoustic cavities to reach an unstable state and collapse may be higher. And conversely, if the sound pressure is reduced, the gas in the cavity dissolved, dissolves into solution, and the cavity ceases to exist. Now let's consider the cushioning mechanism, which occurs during the compressional phase of the cycle, where the acoustic cavities typically collapse. During compression, pressure is exerted onto the acoustic cavity as gas molecules diffuse back into solution. Gas molecules within the acoustic cavity effectively cushion the sound pressure, which suppresses the collapse of the acoustic cavity. One analogy that helped me was to think about holding an inflated balloon in your hand while squeezing. The air inside the balloon cushions the collapse. This effect may explain why the transient cavitation pressure decreases at a slower rate. It is also why degassing is often encouraged as a pre-cleaning step. To explain why the direct field sound pressure increases with less gas, um, we propose a mechanism known as acoustic shielding. The data here is represented by the blue line that increases as dissolved oxygen decreases. And this mechanism can be described by having a presence of acoustic cavities and dissolved gas bubbles that effectively perturb or shield the direct field sound pressure from propagating through. Um, when the sound wave propagates from the transducer and it meets these cavities, it essentially scatters and reflects. Um, which is why the direct field sound pressure is reduced with more gas. In the absence of gas, the sound wave continues to propagate and um, results in a higher level of direct field sound pressure. To summarize, we observed three main trends with decreasing dissolved gas, um, namely the cavitation pressure decreases with less gas and the mechanism here um, has the formation of cavities relying on the presence of gas, right? Without any gas, acoustic cavities cannot be formed. Um, the second trend is that the stable cavitation decreases at a higher rate than the transient cavitation. And we describe this um, through the rectified diffusion mechanism resulting in two, two outcomes, either buoyant cavities form 
that eventually float to the surface and effectively degas the fluid. Um, and the second is that the gas molecules within the acoustic cavity, um, particularly during the compressional state, is cushioning the pressure, um, which limits the, the collapse of the bubble. The third trend is that the direct, direct field sound pressure increases with decreasing gas. And this could be described um, or explained by an acoustic shielding effect that essentially has the presence of uh, gas bubbles and cavities uh, perturbing and scattering the direct field sound pressure. Some final thoughts. Uh, we recognize there are many theories that have been published describing different mechanisms from fluid degassing. Rectified diffusion, acoustic cushioning and shielding, those are just a few of the theories, but um, this cavitation vessel is a very complex dynamic process. And so uh, these are just a few different mechanisms. And in this study, um, measurements of the stable cavitation, transient cavitation, and the direct field pressure indicate that there's multiple mechanisms that likely occur concurrently. Um, and the challenge, though, is that you need to put some experimental care to ensure that we control process parameters like the gas concentration and the temperature and the uniformity across this, this tank. Um, and those continue to remain. Um, that said, we intend to continue with feature work um, that will study um, how dissolved gases can vary with frequencies and temperatures and chemistries. Um, at the end, though, what matters most, perhaps, is really the correlation with, with the application, and that's typically cleaning. Um, and with that, I thank you very much for your time.